thanks for coming along. Um, we're about to get started. Um, we do, um, as Singapore is headquarters for SMATS, and this is our first seminar we do in the series. But um, yeah, we're going to have a bit of fun tonight. Uh, no shortage of topic, is there? Look at that. It is madness. We're complete madness on the world. I'm sure you all agree. And we're going to have a bit of a laugh on that. So it might be a little bit like the principal giving you a lecture tonight, as I'm getting old and cynical, but I'll try and be humorous in that. But uh, a lot of sincerity going to come tonight, so see how you go with it. I'll start officially by wel welcoming you all along. This is the 13th year that we've done this update seminar, and uh, I always remind people it started in 2007 as we looked forward in uh, around about October 2007 and said, you know what, people are drinking too much Kool-Aid, there could be a stock market adjustment coming up, I reckon we might just go out and warn people. And that certainly turned out to be right. You know, 13 years later, um, we've seen all the ups, all the downs, Greece, we've had the recoveries, we've had the recessions, we've had all sorts of madness, and yet the world is still just as crazy, and probably in truth, crazier today than it was in 2007. In fact, we absolutely categorically live in the maddest of times. It's just phenomenal, and I, I wonder how it goes. But we're going to get in and have a chat about that, and uh, so have a little bit of a chuckle, have a little bit of a deep thought you know, dive, and uh, see if we can find some sensibility in all. But as always with the update seminar, it's important that we start with last year's you know, predictions and see how close we got. And this year, unfortunately, I have to say my pass mark wasn't too good. You know? Last year in regards to stock markets, I got pretty right with that one. I said we'd have sustained volatility with some modest gains and I thought the ASX was undervalued. Got that one absolutely correct. And you'll see as we talk about the stock markets in review that that is exactly what happened. With currency, I held my nerve and said, look, I still believe the dollar is worth 75 to 80 cents US. And believe it or not, I still believe that. I'm going to be just stubborn and, you know, and silly and say it. But I did say this was the area I was most likely to be wrong in next year's event. And I have to tell you, boy, was I wrong. But as is always for our overseas clients in particular, at least if I'm going to be wrong, I'm wrong on the right side. Because for you guys, it means you got more Aussie dollars for your sing bucks and that's all okay, I suppose. Interest rates, I thought we had bottomed out. I honestly thought the next move would be up. And I am shocked and stunned that the RBA actually reduced rates three times. I don't think I was wrong. I think they were wrong. And we'll talk about that later. But certainly on the record, can't deny that I didn't get that one right this year. And we knew Sydney would cool. It certainly did. It went 9%. We thought Melbourne would be okay. But Melbourne caught a bit of a cold from Sydney and didn't have a very good year. In fact, none of Australia had that good a year because we had a thing called a federal election. And everybody was adamant that the Labor Party would win, and the Labor Party were proposing some pretty horrific you know, uh, tax changes to property. And as such, the property market went into absolute stall for three or four months, as you'll see. It's just starting to get moving now. So, you know, I got that right with Sydney, wrong with just about everywhere else. But again, I'm not sure I'm going to take the blame for that. But we'll talk about why we got it wrong, because it's not easy to be right. I like to be right. But, you know, if you get it wrong, you've got to at least understand what happened and what were the influences. So let's get straight into it and see one of the reasons we got some of the things wrong is because how can you predict anything when nothing makes sense? That's the world we live in. It is a crazy world. There is definitely screws loose in just about everybody's head. You know, look at the politics around the world. And it's not an isolated environment. Australia, we've now got rid of, what, four prime ministers? we finally got stability because all the ones that have been previously sacked are gone. So there's no revenge plots going on anymore in Australia. And there's theoretical stability because Morrison won the election that was impossible to win. We thought Shorten would win the election and we said that all he had to do was shut up. But he didn't watch our budget review seminar that told him that, and he kept talking. And his talking cost him the election, because every time he opened his mouth, he promised more and more and more. And finally, everyone said, hold on, I think that's too much now. And the changes were too profound, so he lost what couldn't be lost. But he's not the only person that did that. 
The USA, well, we don't have to worry about that too much. That's pretty public. And it gets stranger almost by the day. Almost by the day. And then if you thought that was bad, have a look at the UK. The world's ugliest divorce called Brexit and stuff. And look, you know, they've rotated prime ministers now two or three times. And poor old Boris, he thought he was tough and strong. But the problem in politics, it doesn't matter how tough and strong you are. If you don't have the numbers, you got nothing. And he's struggling with that now. He's begging the Queen not to sack him. But that's not that bad if you look at Italy. That's even more chaotic. Sack the Prime Minister one day, put him back in the next. It's unbelievable. And just to top it off, as if it couldn't get any worse, have a look at the Ukraine. The Ukraine elected a guy who was an actor who played the president in a TV show so everyone thought he'd probably do a good job. And trust me on this, this is fact. I can't make this stuff up. But his entire election strategy was don't get interviewed. He went into hibernation and refused any public experience. If Shorten had done that, he'd be the Prime Minister. This guy knew that if they would talk to him, they'd probably say, you're an actor. But they voted him in. You've got to love the world. Brexit, what do you say about that? It's divorce. Now, I've been through one. That's enough. I don't want to do another one. But imagine it being the most public divorce in the history of man. And let's face it, all that jostling, it's about money. It's not about anything else but money. How much will the EU get as compensation that's now not being funded by the UK? Access and all that. Trust me, UK is more important to Europe than Europe is to UK. But they want the money and their vested interests are just profound. And do we have to talk about Hong Kong? What started as something important and real and substantial to block a really nasty extradition order where people's rights were aptly deployed, has now become shambolic, where they want too much. They got what they wanted and they want more. And now they're going to lose sentiment and it's going to roll into some sort of chaos. And trade wars, how necessary are those? Not. There's no need for them at all, except Trump's po uh, posturing. But every day we wake up and they're solved, they're problematic. They're solved, they're problematic. What does that do? Makes markets very volatile. What does that do? Makes people very rich. Unfortunately, not people like us. But some people are getting very rich on all that tweeting. And you look at Korea and Iran, I'm surprised they haven't dropped some sort of bomb on Iran yet. I hope they don't. There's no reason to. It's complete baloney, but... The jostling is strong. And this is a president who has increased military spending in the US to record levels, yet says he wants to withdraw from conflict zones. I don't know about you, but those two things don't necessarily go hand in hand to me, but that's the way it is. And how many shootings do we have to have in America for change to occur? Apparently more than we've already had. And then it, to top it off, one of the pièces de résistance, I don't know if you've been following the crisis in America with the opioids. There's a company called Purdue Chem uh, Pharmaceutical. They create Oxycontin, which has got so many millions of Americans addicted, 200,000 deaths over the last few while. They're now getting sued by almost every state in America. So much so that they've come up with a brilliant solution. The family has gone in and said, we're going to declare bankruptcy, because in America that doesn't mean much. They're going to hand over the entire company to trustees, and devote the future profits as reimbursement to all the people that have made claim and have had suffering and lost loved ones, which seems like a great idea. They even put a billion dollars of their own money back. But then the very next little bit of micro news, they're separating out of the company a new company which happens to have a cure to get you off Oxycontin. And that's not going in the executorship, that's going into their private pockets. So they sell the bad company, they create a new one, walk away with a cure that they'll sell to the government for a fortune. And that's okay. 
that's okay in the modern world. Why not? And of course, look at the financial markets. Let's face it, we've probably all given up looking because it's just so erratic and nothing makes sense. And the valuations that we're seeing on things, mind-blowing, mind-blowing. And yet here we are in 2019 worrying about climate change locks and they're burning the Amazon forest, the lungs of the world. And what's being done about that? Hardly anything. One church burned down in Paris. They raised hundreds of millions of dollars to fix it. We lose all that forest. Not a dollar has been put forward to replant it. That's embarrassing as a globe, isn't it? Embarrassing. And we don't have to go to the Amazon. We had it here in Singapore. I thought they'd fix that. Luckily, I was on holidays, but I came back and boom, there it is. But it's rain now, so it's okay. So a blue sky for the other day. You, you remember what it was? It must have been a shock when it came out. Were you worried? You could have been. But this is the world we live in. We tolerate this, and that's money that's doing that. It's not nature. It's beast, that beast of humanity. And look, we're still doing very little about climate change. A girl sails across the ocean. She gets all the publicity in the world, but still nothing will happen. And at the same time that we're not doing anything about climate change, we're allowing major corporations to stick straws into almost every decent water supply and sell it to us at a fortune. Is it me? Am I the only one? But when I go to a shop now, it's three, four dollars in Australia for a bottle of water that is basically just filtered tap that most of these companies don't pay a dime in royalties when they take it out of aquifers and spring water things. This is madness. But we've become so tolerant in it. It's just beyond compare. And of course, why are we tolerant? Because the media tells us not to worry. It confuses us and it just becomes overload. And you'd probably forgotten all these things, but you're exposed to them every day. But we're immune. We've given up. You know, the will to fight. But that's insanity. But you look at consequence in the world. It is a real thing. You know, if my little man goes into that, you know, domino thing, the poor guy on the end is going to go flying. But then he'll come back in the other one. But there's different types of consequence. There is accidental consequence. You cross the street, the car didn't see you, runs you over, your legs are broken. That's an accident. But it means you don't walk straight for a long time. Have to take time off. This consequence... There's unintended consequence. I didn't realise that it would happen, but it did. Can't really help that. That just happens. And there's this intentional consequence, which is the worst, I thought. I also thought intentional consequence. Someone did something deliberately that would affect someone else, something else. That used to be the worst, but now we've got a whole other level of consequence, manipulated consequence in the world. People know there's going to be an effect, and they do it anyways because it makes them financial gain, emotional gain, whatever the case. And again, we live in this world all the time. We see it all the time, but we become immune to it because it's too big a scale. And I don't know about you, but I'm screaming because I think I'm going mad watching it. Look how much we spend on stuff. You know, there are people that spend $200,000 to have a week on a super yacht in the Mediterranean. $200,000. Incredible. Buy super yachts, buy this. You know, even the other day I went to dinner here in Singapore. Wine that I know is 20, 30 bucks, $200 on the menu. But we've just become immune. Luckily, first world problem is great. And the values that we have, moral values, financial values, they've changed so much. It's a funny old game. And social media is a large part of it because no one knows what they're doing, no one knows what they're seeing. And it's affecting the way we behave, which surprisingly is very intertwined with our financial well-being and everything else that goes on the planet. Reality and perception as a result have got completely blurred. People think they are in the real world, but they're not. And we've got this thing that I now call dishonest honesty. People are so uninformed that they argue positions that don't exist and are false because they believe it to be true. And there is no substance in their research anymore, but they will not be changed. It's incredible. 
Half the problem with all that is it's all vested interest behind the scene or opinion. I'm not sure which is worse. I think vested interest is. Opinion is just your choice, but vested interest, you have a reason for that to be your choice. Well, I travel a lot. It's probably the thing that I love most about my job. I'm literally 30-odd weeks on the road. I go all sorts of nooks and crannies, talk to all sorts of people in all sorts of places. And let me tell you something. We're all the same. You know, Iranians, they're pretty good blokes. Russians, they're not bad. Singaporeans, fantastic. Hong Kongies, they're pretty happy dudes. Everyone's fine. And we've forgotten that. And we get twisted in all the things that people tell us about people that we don't even know. But when you do cross-culture, as you've got like in this room, when you travel, you realise that it's all the same. So I just want to remind you of what it is to be human because I think we've lost touch, to be honest. Safety is our number one real care. Safety for yourself, safety for your family. Now, that's really important. And that's why you can understand the Afghanis even. Imagine sitting there and just bombs start dropping and you don't know why. I think you'd pick up a rifle and start shooting it too. You know, we want basic safety. We need food, especially me. I think I've had more, sh more than my fair share. But I keep going back to the buffet. We need that every night. And again, we take it for granted in the lucky world we live in that some people don't have it. But we have become oblivious to it. And of course we need shelter. But we've become obsessed with that. Some of the shelters around the place are pretty big now. Super mansions. But it's all basic humanity. Everyone has the same. And I found that everyone on the planet likes a laugh. I don't know if you found different, but to me, I can get a chuckle just about everywhere I go. And we seek opportunity. Opportunity for improvement, for our family's growth, for our own our financial well-being, all these things. That's pretty much all we want as human beings. You know, there's all different scales. Luckily, we don't all want to live in the same house. We don't all want the same piece of chicken. Well, we're here, everyone does want the same piece of chicken with chicken rice. But, you know, that's what it's about to be a human. All this other mumbo-jumbo that they're feeding us doesn't really matter. But what has happened, things have changed a little bit, where we now have a need for validation and acceptance. Friends on Facebook. It's crazy. And look at the torment in the current generation, if they don't get validation from people that don't even matter and people they don't even know. I remember the old days when you would be desperate for the admiration of your peers. Not now. It's strangers. Strangers. And we need to be heard, seen and somehow appreciated. And if we're not, we just can't handle it apparently. Resilience has gone to the wayside. But if we're just keeping ourselves sane and we avoid the news a bit, it's not that bad. Now, the reason I'm putting this up here is not to bore you, but believe you me, our mental well-being, our perception of our surroundings are the things that influence most the economies we live in, the financial markets that we work in, the housing markets, and your day-to-day -day existence. You have to get back to a level of awareness of self and community to understand what's going on, and more importantly, to protect, because that's where it's all getting crazy. So I hope I've bored you enough and I've just provoked your mind just a little bit. You'll have forgotten it soon, but you, know, you can always watch the video later. But now let's have a look how that big jumble of mess and madness affects things like financials. Let's look at stock markets. They, more than anything, are consequence-driven. Trump has a tweet up, up today. Trump tweets again, down. Someone announces this, all it goes. Someone says growth will be slow, everyone's miserable. Someone says growth will be okay, everyone's okay. It's chaos because the difference and, and distance between comment A and comment B is getting narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower. Days, hours, minutes... Why? Because that movement is making people lots and lots of money. Robots are trading on the stock market saying, take advantage of that 0.01% and do it lots and lots of times and make a fortune. Not us, others. 
But that's what they want to do. So they need those tweets. They need all that media. They need all those things to create a reason for stuff to happen. So we're seeing lots of short-term adjustment for issues that may have long-term implications. Even the other day, National Australia Bank announced a $1 billion provision for extra costs, payout under the Royal Commission, etc., etc., etc. Its share price, market capitalization, went down $8 billion. So it said, hey, we're going to lose a billion, and by the way, it makes $6 billion a year, so to them, that's not much money. $1 billion adjustment, $8 billion stock market reduction. That's manipulation. Someone's overcorrected a sensible activity and made it unsensible. It doesn't make any brain thought. But look at the profits these companies are making. You know, I think if you look at the banks again as an example, they've now provided for hundreds of millions of dollars of fines. But that's inconsequential. Inconsequential. There's Purdue handing over the company that was allegedly worth billions of dollars, but that's inconsequential to them. What I don't understand is why aren't people asking, how do you accumulate that much? We're just treating as if they've got some magic machine that's printing money. We forget that it's coming all from us. The reason they can get away with it is because it's only a little bit from each of us. If they came in and swooped and took 50,000 off all of you, you'd be riotous. Be like Hong Kong down in Wan Chai. But because they take $5 here, $3 there, 50 bucks off a few billion people, off a few billion transactions, no one notices. So we all go, it's all okay. No problem here. Keep moving. But it's amazing. And again, I wasn't against, uh, uh, for at all the Trump you know, corporate tax rate cuts. But the amount of revenue gain that that's had in America and the lower taxation is scandalous. But no one says anything about it. The US deficit still at a trillion dollars a year and rising. The debt is so large you cannot calculate it. I don't know if you've ever looked at the US debt clock on, online. It'll make you dizzy because it moves so fast. But the only source to fund it is stock markets. And we've seen now in the last four years, ever since China stopped funding the US deficit, every year we've got volatility in the stock market that coincidentally equates out to the US annual deficit. And I'll show you that in a minute. And that's just a reality. And we're seeing valuations for stuff beyond, beyond imagination, beyond belief. Just as a, a brief example, Beyond Meat, which should really change its name to Beyond Belief, $8.6 billion valuation of that company just went on online. Now, bear in mind, it's actually fallen its share price in the last six months by 30%. So it used to be worth about 12 or $13 billion. Its turnover is $100 million. Turnover. Its profit, actually, it doesn't have one. It's losing $30 million a year. And its net assets is $80 million. So net assets, $80 million. Market capitalization, $8.6 billion. Now, I may not be a very good accountant because I've tried to divide, multiply, add, subtract. I've done everything I could to make that work, and I can't. It's fantasy at best. And Uber... The longest startup in the history of man. Ten years in the making, worth $48 billion apparently. It turns over $11 billion. You can't sneeze at that. But it made $1.9 billion last financial year. It, its net assets are 10. So that's not bad, only five times. But I'm being kind when I say $1.9 billion profit because that was just an apparition one year coincidentally pre-launch on the stock market. It lost $4 billion the year before, $4 billion loss. This year, estimated loss, $8 billion. Now, I don't know about you, I couldn't fund that. Is there anyone who could fund that shortfall? And Salesforce, it's been around a long time. It's a great company. Can't knock it. 
$124 billion market cap as at today on a $13 billion turnover, so 10 times turnover multiple, making just under a billion dollars a year after tax profit. 124 PE on an established company. Now, I've just picked three. I'm not trying to pick on them. I'm not saying they're bad companies. Not at all. They're all real companies. They're all doing real stuff. They're good. I've got no problems with them. But if you had a spare $124 billion, would you buy Salesforce? Even if you had a paltry $9 billion, would you buy Beyond Meat? Probably not. You'd be next to Abramovich on the Mediterranean in your own super yacht, wouldn't you? But that's the world we live in today. Who is allowing this to happen? And again, don't forget, this is a time where the education level of all of the alleged advisors has supposedly never been higher. MBA, multi-degree, you know, super business school. I don't know what school they're going to. I'm pretty sure they stopped at kindergarten. But that's the way it is. But if we have a look at the stock market year on year, you can see it didn't do too badly. The black line is Australia, and you can see it led the pack in the last 12 months, as we did predict. And I've got to tell you, I think it's got more to go because our banking sector is still 20% undervalued. They've been pulling that down. So we've achieved that with an undervalued banking sector. Ironically, it's one of the things that helped it do it because the banking sector was twice as undervalued last year. So if you'd bought banks last year, they've gone up 20%, actually 30% if we did it two weeks ago. But they took back 10% just recently because that's what they can do. But good year, 8% roughly year on year. And you can see there's a little blip at the end. That was just for no reason, just because you can. And then the Dow Jones, just a little bit above. And that's what we predicted, volatile, but a little bit above. And there's the FTSE. Even with all the mess going on in the UK, the FTSE more or less came out square. So it can't be that bad after all. But this is the change in the world. And this is pretty much what I said last year. I said, I don't think we'll get a crash sometime soon. Theoretically, we're due. The last one was 2007. We can't be too far away from it. 12 years is a long time in a stock market bull run. Okay? But the reason I don't believe that we'll have another crash, I said, was because we're having mini crashes all the time if you happen to be here. And let me show you what I mean. Four mini crashes last year. Did anyone know that we had four mini crashes last year? Of course not, because we're oblivious to it all. We're sick of hearing it. We're overloaded. Unless you're in financial markets, you just don't care. But it affects us all. It affects our pensions. It affects our well-being. It affects, you know, our futures if we're investing. So we should care. We should be oblivious. We shouldn't be oblivious. But you can see substantial 5% plus adjustments. Now, this is where the manipulation comes in. Tweet, drop the market 5%. But you always have to remember, one-way traffic is not good for anyone. If the stock market just falls by 5%, that's just bad because I can't make money if it only goes down, just like I can't make money if it only goes up. But when it goes down and up, that's how I make money because I can buy high, sell, or buy low, sell high, you know, and keep moving through. And that's what's going on. And again, the problem is it's not coming to us. They give us the crumbs. They take all of the meat. And trust me, they're not buying from beyond meat. They're going to the real butcher. Thick, juicy ribeyes. But that's what it is. And this is the same reason I'm going to tell you today, I don't think we're in for a big crash next year either. Now, I'm going to go asterisk. There's an election next year. Now, I'm going to hold my nerve because by the time we're doing this seminar, the election will not have occurred in the US. So I don't know if we'll see a massive push upwards or downwards leading up to the election. But Trump has allowed a lot of deregulation and a lot of lower tax. So if he looks like he's going to lose, expect the market to pull back. If he looks like he's going to win, and let's face it, I think his biggest you know, um, you know, advocate was 
Sanders has just had a heart attack, apparently, and then Biden, who he's hoping to lock up for you know, doing stuff in some weird country, you know, they could end up sharing a jail cell. That would be funny, wouldn't it? But, uh, you know, it's hard to know which way it could go. But again, we won't be able to influence it. We'll just be unintended consequence. Or are we? Maybe we're manipulated consequence. I'm not sure. It's all crazy. But that's a reality we live in now. These mini crashes have become the new modern norm. If we have a look, and these are the same stocks that we put on every year, so I'm not recommending them, I'm just putting them as a reference point. But you can see, and this is where we're getting older, and that's why I don't know if I'm getting wiser or madder. It's probably both after the seminar, you'll think. But so you can see, there's the profits. Look, BHP up from 7.7 to 9.5. HSBC, on a bad year stock-wise, the stock went down 12.5, its profit went from 12 to 15. Bank of America, 18 to $28 billion. CBA in Australia, not doing that well, went down. Provisions only. And again, this is one of the jokes of the Australian system. NAB, ANZ, they've all come out with, oh, look, we're putting a billion dollars. It's a provision. Highly likely they won't end up spending a cent. They're just doing it as a publicity stunt so everyone thinks they're doing something. But when they don't pay anybody out, it'll just end up back as profit. But holy mackerel, look at Microsoft. $39 billion profit. No wonder a share price. Look at that, 30%, 31, 46, 27% increase in the last four years. That's incredible. Yet, it's still the same company. It's still the same product. It's just bought out everyone that could be potential competition. And there's Pfizer, 11 billion. It had a bad year, apparently, but it still went up. And Coke... Well, if you don't pay for water, your profit can go from 1.2 to 6.4, and its stock went up 19%. I'm, I'm worried about Coke because they're, they're probably going to have the last few drops of water anytime soon out of those great lakes and down in Australia. What are they going to do when they have to actually pay for water? Someday, surely, we're going to say to Coke, you have to pay at least 20 cents a litre. You're selling it for three bucks. You can't have it for free. And they go, oh, but it falls out the sky. Well, you put your own roof tank in, mate. If it's that easy to get, get a bigger roof, use your own water, don't use ours. 20 cents a litre at least. But look at that, they're phenomenal. And look at those growth rates, they're pretty strong. Now, you can see Microsoft went up 27%, but the, the Dow only went up 3.6. And this, again, is how we get confused because they make one company grow up a lot and they make another one go down a fair chunk. You look at, say, HSB as an example. So we don't know what their number is. We say, oh, it's, it's only 3.6. But somehow they either didn't have Microsoft or it's on the NASDAQ, I suppose. You know, it's just crazy. This is the thing. But there's good old Australia, 8.1%, following up another sensible year of 8.9. And there's the FTSE, just 0.6. Again, you'd think that the FTSE would have collapsed with all that's going on there, but it's okay. Again, we're jostling, we're you know, threatening, we're hoping, we're trying to get advantage, trying to stop their getting advantage. That's what negotiations are. And Trump apparently is the master of negotiation. Just ask him how he dealt with North Korea. But, you know, these are all the things that happen in a commercial world. And again, we're more and more immune to it on a constant, constant basis. Here's the long term, and you can see we've been a long time on the up. It was fairly flat on average, but again, I don't see a big crash coming. Those mini crashes, absolutely. So prediction number one, stock market, bit of same next year as this year. Asterix, watch the political space in America with the election. That's going to have a big bearing. You know, it could be a lot of cash out. That's what's going to happen in America. If they think Trump's going, expect to see a lot of profit taking, which coincidentally will just take 10, 15% off the market. But then expect a rally if he gets back in because they know no rules, do what you want, take whatever you want, wild, wild west. So that's going to be interesting, but Australia will be fairly consistent and fairly stable and everything should be okay. So prediction number one, a little bit carbon copy. You know, see how it goes. Let's look at the dollar. Holy mackerel. This I got totally wrong. 
75 to 80 cents. And what is it? 72? 71? 68? 67? Holy mackerel, that's a fair mark out. You should all leave right now. But why? It can't be worth 70 cents, surely. I mean, economically, are we that much worse? Or is it just interest rates? The RBA did come out three unexpected rate cuts. Surprise, surprise. And again, in economics, if you do drop interest rates, the dollar should go with it. So that makes sense. So at least there is some level of logic to it, even if there's no logic to why they did it which we'll talk about later. But economically, I don't think that the US is stronger than Australia in an economic sense. Don't know about you, but the problem is I do go to the US and I can tell you they're in the big centres, thriving. Everywhere else, disaster. And even Donald with his old you know, Rust Belt stuff hasn't changed much. You know, there's job creation there because they've just taken the jobs off everyone before. And one of the things I reminded people way, way back in 2008, after the stock market crash, I said to everybody, it's all good, jump back in because there's nothing to worry about. And the reason I said that in 2008 was one key thing. The economic power of existence is so powerful in the modern age, people forget how much cloud it has. And by that I mean... Just you and I waking up in the morning, having breakfast, sending our kids to school, driving to work, doing work, having lunch, changing our shirt, going on holiday. Just being on the planet is a massive amount of economic activity. And even in America, when you've got 300 million people that have to go through that existence, it's a massive amount of American activity economically. So the jobs had to come back. They'd been stolen, so they eventually had to go back. Logic prevails. But I don't see it as a stronger economy necessarily than Australia. And one of the proofing points there is our trade terms. Theoretically, our trade's never, ever been better. We're now in surplus. We've never done that. Not in my lifetime. But we did that before interest rates went down and the dollar still wasn't strengthening. We should be theoretically having a stronger dollar because we've now got a better trade position. But somehow or another, that doesn't matter. Three unnecessary rate cuts take precedence. Now, one of the reasons is Australian dollars is just not that big on a trading platform. And as I've been telling everyone for ages, currency is now a commodity. It is traded. But if you have a look at it, there it is to the US. It peaked up there around about 74. I was right there for a minute. I was gloating and everything. I was terrible. I was embarrassed of myself. But then this is what life does. It brings you back to earth, doesn't it? And there it is now, well under 70 cents. But again, look at the volatility. A currency shouldn't theoretically be that volatile, but it is now because it's a commodity. Look at the Singapore dollar. We all know how strong and vibrant the Singapore economy is right now. Justification for the Singapore dollar to be booming and strengthening, yes? You're all looking at me like I've said something wrong. Because the Singapore economy isn't vibrant and booming, is it? But yet the dollar strengthens. I was jokingly saying to someone earlier that I think Tomasic is looking to buy Ayers Rock in Australia. I think that's what, what's going on. <laughs> so they're making sure they get a bit of extra discount on the currency. Something's happening. But this doesn't make sense to me. I don't know about you, but again, if you're fortunate enough to be Singapore and with Singapore dollars or an expatriate working in Singapore, happy days. But the logic isn't there. And this, again, this is when we go back to all of those crazy things I was saying at the start. Things that should happen don't happen, but they've recalibrated our thinking to say, well, that's all right anyways. Because if we started going, "Uh, does not compute, does not compute, we'd all start breaking down. But there it is. Where does it go? I don't know. So I'm going to go on the currency. I'm going to predict that it should be 75 to 80 cents. But most likely it's going to be 67 to 72. I can't see justification going less, but we'll see what goes on. Let's have a look at interest rates. Again, you can see in the rest of the world, you know, the US was at zero for ages, then it went up at a massive rate of knots, and it's starting to decelerate its interest rates. It's had a couple of rate cuts recently. Why? Because they think their economy is going to slow down. And this is one of the nonsenses that I'm talking about. All of a sudden, people are talking about what might happen as though it already has. 
then they're not doing it as preemptive strike, they're doing it as manipulation of, of information. If they say it enough, we'll think it to be true so they can do whatever they want and we'll say thanks for doing that and we'll somehow be appreciative. If you look at Australia, Australia's official rate is now 0.75%. Now just like in America for all those years when the rates were zero, Australia now heading towards 0.75 0, 0 and they're actually talking about going another 0.25, believe it or not. But what people forget is the consequence now, I'm not sure if it's accidental consequence. I'm not sure if it's incidental. I'm not sure if it's you know, manipulative. But the consequence is, if you're a retiree, your revenue in retirement is smashed if you are an interest-bearing person. Thankfully, you have SMATS Consortium that'll give you 10%, 12%, 16%. .000. Otherwise, you're living off your capital. And that's what happened in America. Not only did they steal most of their money, but then they dropped interest rates so low after the, the, the uh, 2007 crisis that they had to live on what was left. And by the time things got better, they were all broke, which means easy to control. That's the other definition. But you can see in Australia, we're down three rate cuts pretty much in succession. Why? Why? There is no justification for it. Now you can see with housing loans, Activity in the, in the housing market had dropped off, not because of rates being high, but prices and fear. And you see it bottomed out because everyone thought Shorten was going to get in. And as soon as he didn't, look at the uptick in owner-occupier activity in particular and investor activity to a lesser extent. That was fear rather than economic. You know, but the two these days go hand in hand. So interest rates are, in, you know, are interesting indeed because they're way too low. If you look at some logic behind that, and when I say that, look at growth. Now, the RBA is saying, hey, look, we want to lower interest rates to protect against lower world growth, lower Australian growth. And you can see fundamentally they're not off the mark. Growth in Australia has slowed sub 2%. But if we look at what that is, the big negative contributor to growth in Australia at the moment is the housing sector. It's got a negative 0.5 effect on GDP growth in Australia right now. So GDP growth has fallen under 2%, around about 1.7. But 0.5 negative means that if you take that out, just for a second, real growth is about 2.2, which is an acceptable range. But you've got to say, oh, Steve, come on. You can't just take that out. That's being selective. You're as mad as the rest of them. But when you think of it, it's pretty obvious that housing was going to have low growth. And the reason is, look at our foreign investment into property markets. Residential investment peaked out at $70 billion in 2016 and has been on the decline since to fall from 70 to $12 billion last year. No surprise that you have a 0.5% reduction in year-on-year -year activity in that sector. So any logical person should be able to look at that and say, that's why it happened. Not, ooh, it's getting low, let's do something. But this didn't fall because it fell off the cliff. It didn't fall because Australia became less popular. It fell because we started cooking the goose. We shot ourselves in the foot. We brought in all these foreign duties. You now, as a foreigner, have to pay 7 to 8% when you buy a property. And this is outrageous because people forget the state government receives this. And on top of that, they also receive about 6% stamp duty. And on top of that, they also receive around about 7% GST revenue because foreigners have to buy brand new property. So in every single transaction, near on 20% of your purchase price goes to the state government, not the federal, the state. 20%. No surprise if people sort of say, I'll just check what else there is before I come back. No surprise. So the RBA should not have been worried about a negative 0.5% 
fall in the investment in residential housing, it should have been shocked that it wasn't more. I'm amazed that it wasn't a minus one. But there's an explanation. But even with an explanation, they still overcorrect. That doesn't make sense. Now, if you're frightened of those entry costs, as you'd know if you're an existing owner, particularly as a Singaporean, the land tax they've got you with as well. So not only is it higher entry costs, but now they're smashing you on land tax with much higher rates than ever before. Queensland, for any expatriate, finally said we'll charge uh, expatriates, citizens and PRs, less than usual. They've been charging them a surcharge for years and they finally removed that to give them an in Australia rate. But everyone else is paying top, top dollar. But this is why it happened. It's logical, it's sensible. You increase the cost, you lower the activity. You can't be surprised if that means a slower economy. But the year on year will then balance out because as that decline goes, the next year isn't under pressure to rise because it's now on a lower base. So growth becomes more achievable. When you're at a high point, it's inevitable to have a reduction. But once you get to that reduction, it's not that difficult to get another increment the year after. So it'll only be a small temporary thing. And these governments are foolish because their revenues have dropped almost 90%. So even though they're collecting all this extra money, because of the significant drop in volume, the cash that they receive is down near on 90% from what it was. So that golden goose, it's on special tonight. You can have it at the back when we get out. But ironically, in this world where the RBA has misread the play in my book, it means that we're the benefactors. If we're property investors, it means we can now enjoy unbelievable low interest rates. And the last few years, it's been very hard to get loans, but it's getting easier. It's not easy yet but it's getting easier. So the servicing rules have started to be modified to make sure that you can get the loan that you want. There are more and more options, including coming to a place near you are SMAT's you know, lending option, which will be very, very uh, yeah, favourable. And the rate's crazy. It's now cheaper to borrow in Australian dollars than it is to borrow in Singapore dollars on Australian property. That's never happened in my lifetime. Never. That's not bad. And we're starting to see rates from 3%. Now, it's not easy to get those, but if anyone can, SMATs can, so come and see our lending team and we'll get it for you. But that means that your holding cost is hardly anything. We're traditionally used to rates at around about 45 to 55 So that's a significant reduction. Just as well, because rental yields have also come off too. But at least you got both at the same time. How long this lasts, I don't know. But if they keep misreading the play, anything could happen. They seem to put rates up when they shouldn't, take them down when they shouldn't, and we just dragged along for the ride. Who knows? If we come now, well, so I'll predict here on interest rates, I'll predict that I think we've definitely bottomed out, but the RBA is on the, the record, so they want another cut. I can't see the logic behind it, but they may well do it. They shouldn't do it, I'm going to say that. I hope they don't do it because it's not stimulating anything. It's not stimulating anything at all. The banks aren't passing on all of the rate cuts and they've kept $14 billion a year of additional interest revenue, believe it or not. So prediction for interest rates, they should flatten out and rise. They'll probably just stay where they are for a while. Let's get back onto the property market now, our favourite thing. And, you know, Sydney is getting nicer, apparently. It's moved up the tracks. This is the world's most livable cities. Melbourne used to be, as you see, number one for all those years. And Vienna took it over a couple of years ago and has held on to top spot. Now, again, as I said last year, and you know, it's the value of the advertising. Have any of you seen headlines about how Melbourne is the second most livable place to live in the world? No. Because who cares about second? Who, won, who came second at the Grand Prix in Singapore? Anyone know? I don't know. Doesn't matter. And that's the problem. Melbourne got all the press when it was first, doesn't get much when it's second. But it's still there. But Sydney's now in third, which is a fairly big uplift. It was 11th for a while. 
So it's done something right. I don't know what they did there, but they tied it up and it's back at number three. And Perth, I don't, this is where the credibility of this has to be questioned. He can't have Perth at 14. It should be at number one. <laughs> but I have to report it to you officially and that's what it is. But you can see there's, in the top 14 places, you have four of Australia's cities. And let's face it, we only have four real cities. So that's not bad. All those other countries, they've got lots of cities. They've only got one or two of them in there. Oh, that means nothing. You know, so that's the way it goes. But I've been to most of those places now. Australia's still the best. I went to Copenhagen. Yeah, that's all right. It's nice, but I'm not going back. <laughs> you know, Vienna's gorgeous if you've got lots of money to live in the centre, in the, in the centre of the city. Apart from that, it's not that flash. But Australia, I keep reminding people, it's gorgeous in depth. You've got a really great city and you keep driving and it's still great. There's only pockets of not so great. But even though not so great is better than everybody else's good some, some places. That's why we keep being the most livable. And here is again, as I always remind you, the secret to Australia's success, our population growth. And this is ironic. We're still running and now at a record high in the last probably eight, nine years at 404,000 people last year, despite the fact that you might remember the government cut the migration quota in Australia because they're worried about overpopulating the country. It's so small down there. There's no room, apparently. We've got 25 million people now in Australia on the same land mass of America that has 300 million. And I don't even know how many is in Russia, but it's a fair few. I've met a few of them. But uh, the reason why it's still going up, even though the quotas have gone down, is people always forget it's a five-year arrival visa. So if you got your visa a year, two years, three years ago, you don't have to turn up for up to five years. So that change in visa numbers won't really impact things for about four to five years. That's just the way it is. Because in New South Wales, it's still trending upwards. And that's why it's just had the slowest or the shortest bad property cycle in Australia's history, literally 12 months. Unbelievably fast from miserable to it's okay now. Victoria, oh my God, it's collapsing. It's collapsing. It's three years now that it's been going downwards from 145 to 143 to 139. Oh, it's diabolical. But it's still the biggest quantum in Australia, 140,000 people. So what that means is if we had a meeting of everybody that arrived in Melbourne last year, we couldn't even put it at the MCG. The MCG only takes 100,000 people. So we said, hey, welcome party. The MCG is not big enough. It's crazy. The problem in Melbourne is they're not building enough stuff for these people of the right stock. But Queensland really starting to get moving again. You can see those population numbers are good. They bottomed out at 59. They're up 70, 81, 89, 90. Trending now. And WA, which has been smashed in its property market because of its poor population growth, finally trending in the right direction. So at last we can see good stuff coming. But you see, all capital cities, strong population growth. Strong. 1.6 across Australia. And I'll remind you, as I do almost every year, this shows how economically useless Australia is. The reason I say that is every year we have about 1.6% more customers come into our store. 400,000 of them sitting down in the back row, cup of coffee, love, yes, please. 1.6% more customers, yet our revenue only goes up 0.3, 0.4%. So retail trade last year in Australia went up 0.3. 1.6% more customers, 0.3% more sales. Most people would be sacked. Get a new marketing manager, get a new operational manager. Nope, but in Australia, it glosses over all cracks. Everything's fine. And this is why we've had, as Greg said earlier, 26 years of consistent economic growth. Because these people come educated and cashed up. It's too far to swim 
to Australia. And that's why we keep the sharks, just in case. First line of defence. But this is the greatness of Australia. We have this, plus we have exports and we have animals, and we have all sorts of strange things that you Singaporeans may never have seen unless you went on holiday to Australia. But this is our secret here. This is what keeps our cycles real and moving. And as you can see, everything's going pretty much according to plan. I'm leaving Sydney just in the slow growth phase, but just. It's out of there in no time, and it's already, you've seen clearance rates rise, etc. But it's in mainly the residential stock because there's 120,000 plus people looking for a home. In Melbourne, 140,000 people looking for a home. But they keep building small junk. These people don't want to live in small junk. They want to live in a house. They've migrated. Build them a house. We'll be right. But if you have a look again at the housing growth, you know, on the credit, it fell off the cliff in recent time because of tougher bor borrowing conditions and then re more recently fear of what the Labor government under Shorten might do. But it's starting to recover, things are starting to get moving. But one of the things that is quite interesting to me is I talk all the time about the importance of supply and demand. The reason why Australia is safe is our demand is constant. Those three, 400,000 people a year arriving is new demand. We need new housing if there's new demand. It's not just people rotating. But you can see now, for the first time in quite a while, the trend of new approvals is on the decline. So supply, which normally is needed to match demand, supply has been getting quite strong and keeping it in relative balance, but not in the old stock in Sydney. But now the supply is also soft. So we've got consistent demand, we've got softer supply, guess what? Housing prices will rise. Now the joke here and the big irony is that if you remember as recently as about 6 to 12 months ago, everyone in Australia was whinging that low interest rates were driving property prices up. It was the talk of the town. Terrible. They're ruining the market. Low interest rates. is letting everyone pay too much. The irony is they've just dropped interest rates and now they're saying they had to do that to support the housing market. Well, what is it, people? Is it one or the other? I don't know. But supply is the only way you can keep a market in relative equilibrium, and that's in decline. And housing credit, we strangled the banks. And you know what they did? They said, you know what, we're making so much money, whether we lend or not, to any new customers, we'll just stop doing it for a while and see how that goes. Now they're slowly saying, oh, look, we are a bank after all. I suppose if you're here, we might as well give you a loan. Who would have thought? But that's the thing. From an investor point of view, when that supply is stagnating or falling and the demand is on the rise, believe you me, that's opportunity. If we have a look at the June figures, interestingly enough, in March 19 this year, for the first time, I think, since the global financial crisis in 2007, Every place in Australia was in negative growth. That hasn't happened for 12 years. That's called the shortened cyclone. That's how afraid all of Australia was if they got in. And why they said, no thanks. Don't take my word for it. Go check the polls. Last time I checked, Morrison's in at the lodge. Okay? But that was an apparition. It was a fear rather than a reality. It's a perception change rather than living in what's known. But you can see things will quickly start to pick up and recover. Because now all of a sudden people say, oh, look, it's okay. It's not too bad. Interest rates are low. The prices in Sydney are still horrendously high. They fell, yep, 9%. But did you see what they were before that? Frightening. So even with a 9% reduction in Sydney, it's still frightening. There is no one who is buying a property in Sydney today after a 9% fall that would walk into my office and say, Steve, I can't believe my luck. Look how much I paid for this property. It's so cheap. Because it's not. 
But that's the price because it's one of the top three world cities. You've got record low interest rates and you've got record high migration of dudes with lots of money. So if you don't buy it, they will. And that's why those prices are there. And that's why Sydney will recover. You see, its reduction was reduced to 0.5 in the following quarter. That's why it's going to be a very, very quick turnaround, less than two years moving from end of cycle to new cycle of growth. That's pretty good. Melbourne should not have come off, technically. But the significant fear of Sydney was overpowering. And the main reason for that is the news centres are heavily out of Sydney. So all the press you had in the whole of Australia for the last 12 months was, oh my gosh, the property market is terrible. But it wasn't. The Sydney property market was terrible. But they didn't say Sydney property market, they just said property. So everyone said, oh, I didn't know, but it must be bad here in Melbourne. Let's not do anything. Just like when Sydney was flying, they would be going, hey, the Australian property market's doing amazing. And I was sitting in Perth going, what are you talking about? I'm losing money, mate. Queenslanders couldn't figure it out. They looked outside and it was still raining. But that's just what happens. So Melbourne got spooked, but 130-odd thousand people. One and a third MCGs arriving every year and they're going for it. So expect that to be a short, short and quick turnaround and opportunity abound all over Australia. Low rates, low supply, more importantly, high migration still coming in. It's a perfect storm. Take advantage. Now, you see, Sydney had to come back. It came back 10% officially year on year, but it still did 5% over the five. You know, Melbourne came back seven, as I say, unnecessarily. Brisbane was one of the top performers with just 0.4. Perth, for some reason, slid 5%. I cannot understand that. We've been doing pretty well. So I don't know, but statistically they are. I think it's because of very, very small turnover. But more importantly for me, the long-term averages are still good. And then this is the stat that I've been putting up for a little while. You can see in 17, blatantly, and this is why I've been predicting Sydney to cool for a while, it was 55% above the national average. It had to slow down because it was getting way over whack. It's now 43% above the national average. Now, that's more acceptable, but probably still a bit high. Now, I don't think that it's going to grow more than the average. I think the average is going to kick back up quite quickly. I think all of the states are going to enjoy a period of growth, which is going to lift the average, but the average in Sydney as a percentage will probably come towards the 40, 37, 38 mark because the lower base will rise and everybody will benefit. So... I think there's opportunity in everywhere in Australia. You just have to make sure you pick a nice, livable property. That's the secret. Nothing crazy, just a nice, livable property. The Australian average, 6% down last year, 3% up for the last five. One of the reasons that I keep reminding you that it's stable in our market is the vacancy factor. And you can see Sydney's vacancy has actually gone up. It was 2.5% this time last year. It's increased its vacancy to 3.3. So it's 0.8% worse. The main reason for that is supply coming into the market. So it's created a bit of a fix. But there's still mass demand from the new migration. And you can see in the last quarter that vacancy contracted by 0.3%. So you can see there's more tenants than there is properties, which again, as an investor, is what you're looking for. You see, Melbourne's roughly in you know, balance because there is a lot of supply, a lot of high-rise they built there, but the problem is that high-rise is generally not livable. So the people that come in say, I'm looking for a nice place to live. They go, well, there's this little place. What else? Oh, no, that's it, mate. Oh, well, I'll go there for a few months while I find something nice. And they get stuck there for a while unless they release the checkbook. You have to. Brisbane, 2.4 is very good. You know, sitting there nice in stock. And they'll get a lot of inflow of people selling in Sydney, selling in, in Melbourne and heading up, retiring. And Perth, this is one of the reasons I'm very bullish on Perth. Its vacancy 
has come off 2% in the last 12 months and 4% in the last two years. So all those people were leaving. Our population growth went to hardly anything in WA. But you can see it's now recalibrating. The population growth is getting back to normal. And that tightening of vacancy is the first signal in any property market that opportunity is soon to follow. So I'm very, very bullish there, very comfortable in Sydney, very comfortable in Melbourne, very comfortable anywhere in Australia, provided you buy a nice, livable property. Doesn't matter if it's an apartment, a townhouse, a house, a villa, a mansion, a shoebox, I don't care. But it has to be livable. So you'd have to be a very, very small person to buy a shoebox. And all I know in humanity, I don't know if you've ever toured around, particularly Europe and all those other places, when they say, hey, look, come through the old cottage. And I'm not even that tall, but I'm smacking my head. And then I go down to the corner and I'm looking at all the, the kids there that have got parents that are 5 foot 10 and 5 foot 11 and the kids 6 foot 7. So I don't know about you, I'm not sure I would be buying small properties for the next generation. Just as a point of note there. But all over Australia, looking pretty good. And you see, we're seeing rental growth virtually everywhere except for Darwin, which is no surprise because it was a bit of an artificial market. Never been a fan of there. But you can see that lets you know stability, sensibility and good growth. Finishing off, you'll be glad to know, what's the survival guide? There is loads of madness. I hope I haven't bored you too much with it, and I hope you recognise some of it, because if you don't, you won't survive. I'm not telling you this just to bore you. I'm telling you this to try and help you. We can't stop the madness, but we can survive it. How do we do that? Don't take things on face value. Try and dig in and do the research. And not just on face value, but please don't take them on Facebook value. That ain't going to work. There's lots of good quality research around. It's everywhere. That's why we do the seminars for you. Understand there's always a vested interest when someone tells you that. When Donald tweets, he's trying to provoke something to get a result. When Boris thumps, he's trying to move things in his direction. He just got it wrong. There's always a vested interest from advisors or whatever. We have a vested interest. You know, your success is what creates our success. So we have a very vested interest in making sure you're okay. But understand that and make sure you ask, what do you get out of it? Anyone who's ethical will have no questions in telling you. But make sure you understand what you're being told and why you're being told it so you can understand if it's right or not. And you've got to weigh it up and say, well, is it sensible and is it probable? If it's an incredible claim, can it be achieved? Now, it's harder these days than ever to know that because let me tell you, stuff that was improbable is actually now probable. There are things now that we can do that no one would have ever imagined were possible. And I see it in opportunity all the time in business in the share market. The problem that I have is it's often already outpriced. If you look at Beyond Meat as a classic case, it is going to be a fantastic company. But it's not worth $9 billion today. That's probably its value in about three years' time. But they're making you pay for that three years' growth now. So even if you jump on the bandwagon and it does super well, you'll go, well, how come I didn't make any money? They go, well, mate, you paid what it was worth. Three years ago today, the guy that sold it to you, he's laughing. But you've got to check that it's probable that you've got it right. Never be afraid to just pause, reflect. And I think one of the most underestimated things you can do, procrastinate. It's wonderful. I've all said in property, if you procrastinate when you're an owner, it's fabulous. But procrastinating if you don't own, that's usually bad. So you'd, sometimes it is best to pause, but make sure you know what's going on around you and don't get too heated up too quickly. And try and pick the trends. These kids are getting taller and they're also getting more incompetent. I don't know how they're going to survive when we're all gone. But I do know they're not going to look after us. When we say, son, would you wheel me over there? I'll go, I'm busy. What? 
but he'll say, but if I do come over there, how much will I get? <laughs> so you'll be able to bribe them, but the key there is you better be a successful investor because for bribery, you need cash. <laughs> Just remember that. But these trends are going on all the time. Just try and be aware of them. And if you can, be sane in your own space. And that's getting harder. You know, every time I turn around, you know, it's now fashionable to be mentally ill. I'm wondering when I'm going to ask for my day off. I'm, it's coming because I get it. But it's resilience. People forget we've had mental illness forever, forever. It was called sadness and sorrow and melancholy and all sorts of names. But now we've given it creation. But you can be sane in your sadness. It's not that bad. But just remember the sun comes up and you'll be okay. And always seek out quality and value. In money, in life and everything, that's what it's about. You can't make money out of junk unless you're lucky or sneaky. I've never been that lucky and I'm really bad at being sneaky. So I have to go for quality and value and that's always going to put you in good stead. With shares, good, good companies, with good balance sheets, good profits, with property, good suburbs, with good floor plans and more space rather than less. It's not hard to see it if you open your eyes. And just seek out some simple fundamentals. Just because someone tells you doesn't mean it's true. Just because the RBA is putting interest rates, I think they've got it wrong. It's not under, you know, a, a strangeness to see a reduction in growth if there's a reason for it. They just don't want to connect the dots. They take the easy option. But what happens if they might be right and things do get worse, then what do they do when they've already taken interest rates down to such a ridiculous level? They've shot their gun off at a shadow when maybe a danger is lurking around the corner. Makes no sense. But you've got to ask the questions. You've got to do that. And the great thing is we live in a world where that information is readily available. I pulled most of this together this afternoon because I knew I was talking. You can go on Google and go mad. Or just come here next year and we'll see how we went and it could be fun. And make sure whatever you do, just have a good reason to do it. And a good reason is never to make money. A good reason is because you think it's good value. You think that you might need it. It could help your family. That's good reason. If money is the only motivation, you probably won't. So just have a good reason to do it. And I can report the final bit of good news for you. Australia is the sanest crazy person in this madhouse. And that's why 400,000 people seek insanity refuge in Australia every year. That's why you guys are here listening about Australia because you know they're the sanest crazy people around. So it gives us a little bit of comfort to know that, a little bit of protection. And whether you're an investor, an expat, a future resident, or just like kangaroos, Australia's the place for you. And I'll, just on that note, I'll, I'll have to tell you one little story from my travels. We were in Vienna or in Salzburg, and now in Vienna and Salzburg, you know what? They're selling T-shirts to the Chinese because they're coming on en masse. Do you know what the, the T-shirts say? No kangaroos here. Because <laughs> the Chinese are rocking up and going, I'm in Austria, kangaroo, kangaroo. <laughs> and I, I kid you not, this is how bad we've got. They didn't check, no research. They've come to Austria to see the kangaroos, and there isn't any. On that note, I wish you all good investing, a sane and happy year, and good luck.